There we go. All right, we are started. Hey there, welcome everybody. It's two hours UTC and it's time again for Astronomy Daily Live. So welcome everybody, come on in, come on in. You know, the one thing that I forgot to do is pull up my chat. I'm gonna try to do that. Um, yeah, let me, uh, let me do that really, really quick. That's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a pretty, pretty thing, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna do it anyway. Hearing a bunch of echo from Bobby. Bobby, what's going on over there? Hey, that the much. I'll just, um, uh, I'm just trying to turn down the uh, phone and stuff, try to mute it. Ah, mute the phone, mute the phone. Yeah, yeah, well, welcome everybody, welcome. So this is a daily live stream where uh, I and a few friends get together every single day in sort of this virtual porch and we um, uh, we sit around and we grab our consumable of choice, whatever that, that might be. I usually like um, the hydrogen hydroxide, so H H O H. It's a nice, it's a nice balanced molecule. Ah, see, and I'm muting that. Hold on a second, because uh, I'm trying to pull up my chat here really quick, like, and so I'm seeing my live stream. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to kill that. But yeah, we sit around for a little while. It's very, very, you know, casual and fun and um, get together, talk astronomy, talk science, talk all things nerd for a little while each and every day. And uh, I thoroughly like it. I hope everybody else else does. And, you know, this live stream is for everyone, right? So um, whether you're new or or or, you know, just a pro at all this kind of stuff, you are extremely welcome in here, you know, to come in, chit chat about, you know, what you're doing. If you have any kind of questions or comments or anything like that, absolutely, you know, um, um, bring them in here. There is, there is so much to think about and, you know, to talk about um, in terms of the science of astronomy um, and science in, in general that, that, uh, uh, I don't think that, that that we'll ever ever have anything, uh, you know, to not um, talk about. In fact, the biggest problem I have, right, is like, okay, you know, out of the thousands and thousands and millions of things, you know, that can actually be thought about and talked about and and uh, and all that. It's like, you know, one of the one or two things that that you know we're going to talk about. Um, today and and uh, it's just a never-ending thing, right? There's there there are sort of sort of the current concepts, right? There's there's the history of astronomy and you know the history of science, which which is which is an epic, an epic story, right? Just absolutely epic. Um, and then there's all the new stuff that you know is is. Um, 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 going to be happening and, and it's being planned, planned on being happening. And, and, you know, it's just, it's, uh, um, like I say, you know, the science of astronomy is, is, is broad and wide and deep, right? It's, it fills this huge volume, huge volume. And, um, uh, you know, that can be overwhelming. Absolutely. Right. But the cool thing about astronomy is that the entry point, you can come in at, at any level, at any angle. Um, and, you know, if you just want to sort of focus on one little piece of it, fine. You will be completely satisfied. Right. Um, so, so, uh, so, you know, that's at least one of the reasons why I like it is that there's just so much, right? You know, when I was a kid, it's like, you know, how can, what do I have to do to, to, you know, get into a situation where I can, you know, think about the universe, right? What do I have to do? You know, what do I have to be, right? And it's like, you've got to be an astronomer, right? So 
here we are, right? So, uh, so very, very cool. All right, well, Bobby's on the panel. I think Tom is still on the panel. In fact, I'm not looking at, at my stream. Yeah, there's Tom. Hey, Tom, what's going on? Hey, Cosmic. Uh, not too much. How you doing? Hope things are well. Um, I did see a couple of uh, launches coming up here. Um, cool. What's what's happening? Well, the looks like China is gonna has a launch scheduled for their March their long March three B with a, some kind of communication satellite. That one's supposed to be. Uh, this this evening or tomorrow morning, twelve ten p.m. Oh, twelve ten p.m. So I don't know if this one went or not. Uh, we'll have to check on that. Uh, SpaceX has a launch scheduled for a Falcon Nine. It's supposed to deploy ten iridium satellites into low Earth orbit. That one is in about thirteen hours. Thirteen hours and twenty four minutes from now going out of uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Cool, cool. Now, um, these, these, these are the new, um, new satellites that don't, don't have the big panels on them to reflect and stuff, right? Yeah, this, so, this will, yeah. Uh, eventually, there won't be any iridium flashes to be seen. I think they said the last of those, either this year or early next year, would no longer be in service gotcha. and that's yeah they're replacing the ones that had that nice little flash with some newer ones that don't have the same panels i guess yeah yeah all right so um who here has seen an iridium flash i don't think i've seen one that i know was one you know i may have seen one and not known it but oh ah, okay yeah it they're I'm the same way too just a bunch of slackers around here. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, you gotta hurry. You gotta hurry up and get with it. Yeah, you can. Um, 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 you can actually go over um, to the heavens above site, um, punch in, you know, your um, latitude and longitude, and it will tell you. Because I think, right? I think there's a, there's at least one or two left. Right? Is that true? Yeah, I, th I think there's still some of the, the those older style ones in yeah, service. Yeah, they're pretty cool to see. You know, I mean, it's 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 not as if you're gonna miss out or anything, but it's kind of cool, you know, to see you know sort of a very 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 bright bright thing, you know, just sort of you know shooting across the sky, right? I mean, it moves as fast as a satellite does, um, but it's very very bright, um, you know. Well, I, I go out and watch the space shuttle whenever it's going overhead. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, I, um, uh, yeah, see the shuttle, see, you know, the space station um, for sure. Um, you know, when they have um, launches um, to the space station, sometimes, you know, um, you can get lucky enough to actually see, you know, the station you know, going across the sky first, and then right behind it is another little dot um, um, following it along, and uh, that that is very cool to see. Yeah, uh, um, it's a uh, it's a software the, cosmic. It's a software defined receiver still in your plan. It's it's still in the plan somewhere. Somewhere I'm okay. gonna have to look for that plan. Uh, uh, if you're gonna be like watching the ISS. Um, you can do a Google search of ARISS, Amateur Radio on the ISS, oh, yeah. and you'll get notified if when there's going to be some activity from the ISS, and then you can use your SDR to monitor it. Very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah, that, that you know, is is really, really awesome, right? You know, they've, they've got, um, coming out of the ISS, they have ham radio. They have um, TV too, or I mean, not exactly video, but they have pictures, right? Is that yeah, true, slow Bobby? Scan, slow scan television, yeah, that's slow, it. Slow scan um, um, TV. Now that that you know, they usually just sort of you know send down you know some kind of uh, you know, some kind of tacky picture um, or something, but you know 
you got to think about it, right? You know, where it's coming from and how you're getting it, right? And that is that is very, very cool. That's now, Tom cool. was going to say something. You was about to say something, Tom? Mute. I don't, I don't know what I was going to say. So I think, um, I think um, it was just about the, the uh, ISS and not ever seeing the capsule chasing it across the sky. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a pretty cool thing, you know, to see, see too, you know, but you gotta, you know, you definitely, those kinds of things, you gotta be at the right place at the right time because those, 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 you know, they happen um, relatively fast now, right? You know, I think they can get a uh, um, 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 something up, you know, to the space station in a matter of hours now, you know, if they time things right. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Ert Pradio. What's up, Ron? Hey there, ERT Radio. Nice, nice to see you. Oh, uh, um, so tomorrow morning at 10 hours, Central Standard Time. Uh, I'm actually going to be on um, ERRT um, um, radio. Um, you know, just um, chit chatting about um, whatever um, Ron wants to talk about. I have no idea what he wants to talk about. So it'll probably be you know a little bit of astronomy and you know um, whatever else. So so uh, um, um, make sure to check out his show. Um, as I said, actually, I guess it. It starts at nine nine a.m. Central Time. Um, maybe you can tell us in the chat just to confirm from that. But um, I think it's nine a.m. Central Standard Time is when that's going to be happening. So uh, yeah, yeah, um, looking forward to that. Um, yeah, you know I can talk astronomy all day long, so it's perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, uh, cool. about, about ISS, you could actually just start with this 20, this is like for about $20, and then, it, like, what's also good about it, it comes with, it, with, a, with a starter antenna, and you could always use that starter antenna and this, as this dongle right here to really start listening to some satellites and ISS. Very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing that those little things can just, you know, sort of do that. Just amazing. So, yeah, yeah. Well, um, definitely on the list. Um, a little, probably a little bit um, um, pushed down on that, but uh, not too much. Now, are you going to settle up here or are you just going to sort of keep wiggling around? There you go. All right. One thing I like about popular software defined receivers is there's it's, it's it's more super cheaper than a more super expensive tabletop receiver. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know I mean, um, um, it sort of looks like you know you get a lot of bang for your buck too. Yeah, it's very very great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well. Cool. Well. I've been working on my um, um, photometry thing um, today a little bit. Um, like I was saying yesterday, what what I've realized is is um, something that that I I thought that I could ignore. Um, it turns out that I can't, and this is this concept of of um, the atmospheric extinction, where where um, uh, uh, you know as a star rises in the sky it actually gets um, 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 brighter you know because it's that that light is actually passing passing through um, less and less air right you know when it's really really low on the horizon you know that light has to go through a bunch of air but when it's um, um, straight up it's got to go through a lot a lot less and the interesting thing about that is that there's a wavelength dependency. So, so blue light um, will actually be much dimmer um, down down low um, um, than it is up high, and that's why you know, for instance, um, sunsets are red, right? Because all 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 the blue um, gets you know scattered away. Um, and is really, really, really dim. And so we only see all the red light. 
Um, and so, you know, blue stars, um, you know, um, really, really down low are going to be fainter than um, um, red stars in the same same place. And as as those stars rise, the blue star is actually going to get brighter um, faster than um, the red star. So uh, uh, I I I didn't think that I was going to have to take that into account, but it turns out um, um, that I do. Um, and we actually saw that here here um, live on the live stream a couple of days ago, uh, where I took took that um, data and actually fit a line to it and um, looked at three different stars and noticed the slopes of those lines were all different. And it turns out that you know the star that was the bluest had the um, steepest slope, and then the next bluest one was you know a slightly less slope and then um, um, the reddest one had um, the least slope so it all makes absolute sense and so um, now I've had to go back into my my code you know my software and um, 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 make some changes to you know sort of account um, for all this and that's sort of what I'm doing doing now and the interesting thing about all of this, is that well one um, when I make those corrections um, um, to the photometry um, my results um, you know of actually measuring you know, the brightnesses of these stars should actually be uh, even better and I'm thinking you know maybe like a factor of two better if not more, and that's and that's absolutely fantastic, absolutely fantastic. But one of the other really really cool things is that is that uh, this this um, um, is going to open a a, a a a new door, which I didn't think that I was going to be able to open. Um, I didn't even think about it until I saw this, and it's like wow. Um, since since there's a wavelength dependency um, here, I can actually look at the slopes of these stars and say that one's a blue one, that one's a red one, that one's a little less blue, that one's a little more red. I can actually do uh, uh, you know some some some. Well, I don't know how crude or how you know fine I can do this, but um, I'm going to be able to to actually determine um, um, colors of of stars, and when when one can determine um, colors of stars, uh, that opens up uh, a whole a whole new new realm um, of science. Which which like I said, I I didn't think that I was going to have have um, that kind of access, but um, it turns out um, that I'm going to, and it's just the simple fact that the atmosphere is is there, and um, different wavelengths of light react differently, um, and and uh, and so I can take advantage of that, and I can actually um, I think use that information to 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 uh, um, um, look at the colors of stars and like I said um, you know once you get an idea of what the color of a star is um, that opens up all kinds of possibilities so so uh, yeah yeah that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, um, thing there so so uh, so yeah you know we'll see how all that goes I just just I mean uh, just before um, starting up the live stream, I ran my code for the first time. Um, I've got the results um, sitting on this other machine over here, um, waiting to be looked at. I sort of looked at them, and it's like, huh, I don't think that's quite right. So I'm probably going to have to go back into the code a little bit and um, um, mess around a little bit more, or you know, sort of see, see, you know. Um, what I was seeing wasn't wasn't entirely consistent. So so uh, 
So yeah, I'm gonna have to um, look at that. But yeah, I'm sort of um, on my way um, to to um, um, doing that. And if nothing else, I'm gonna be able to to you know take that effect out, um, which which is at least you know one of the primary goals. Um, you know because over a short amount of time, um, a single star you know shouldn't shouldn't be changing in brightness. Now, I mean, it can, if it's a variable star and all that, you know, but typically over the course of a couple of minutes, a normal star, you're not gonna see any change in, in um, um, brightness. And, you know, especially the kind I'm seeing where it's sort of a gradual thing. Um, so, so, uh, um, uh so so yeah yeah and like i said you know the slope of that um, changing in brightness you know how how these stars change in brightness tell me something about the color of these stars and uh i i think that is very very cool so so uh yeah um i'm gonna have to you know make sure you know the code is okay and everything else um but um once that's done um I'm going to start um, I'm looking at these slopes and and you know seeing what I can do with that information too. So it's very very cool and uh, science science at its best. I love it. All right, well, cool. Let me uh, let me dive over onto the chat and make sure that everything is okay over there. Do, 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 do. Um, can you add a not bot command about uh, about my Discord server for radio persons? Um, yeah, I can. Why don't Why don't we talk about that in the after show? Um, remind me to do that, and and uh, um, and yeah, I I can definitely add add a little uh, add a little uh, um, night bot command there for your um it's your friend's um discord server right um i forget his name his name is ethan best ethan ethan yeah 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 so so yeah yeah we we can definitely we can definitely do that so all right well cool um i think what i wanted to do is i wanted to dive back into messier 20 um which was our object of the day yesterday and i wanted to look at at least some of the papers um, that that are being um, written about it, there were there were quite a few. There were there were like three hundred and some. So, um, what I thought that that we could do um, is just sort of look at some of the latest ones. Um, Simbad is really really great in this case because they 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 um, um, they've ordered you know the papers by by date. And so the most recent ones are way up at the top, and the oldest ones um, are um, way, way at the bottom. So what I thought that we would do um, is look at a few of the newer ones, right? You know, maybe from, you know, 2018 or so, um, and then go all the way to the bottom um, and look at some of the earliest ones uh, and see, you know, when the first, um, paper, you know, scientific journal paper um, was um, written about this this thing. Um, I would think that you know the Messier catalog itself, back you know what, seventeen somethings, um, that would probably be you know one of the first ones that um, we would see. But then you know there might be a huge, huge, huge gap. But let's not guess anymore. Let's uh, let's go over there. Let me. Uh, let me get myself all set up here. Do -do 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 -do. Um, M20. Yeah, I've still got it. I've still got it here. So, all right, cool. I am ready to rock and roll. I've got, the, I've got the kitty on the lap. All is well. All right. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. We're going to go to infinity. Hold on. Woo! There we go. To infinity and beyond, 
And then I'm going to go over here, and here we are. So, so yeah, there were 368 total um, um, references, at least according to Simbad. And you know, one of the things that I notice with Simbad fairly often is that sometimes he'll they'll list a paper that is sort of supposed to, you know, at least mention this object. And sometimes they don't, and and uh, you know, I, you know, I don't know if that's a, if that's you know some kind of a, 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 a weird problem you know that they have, or if it's you know just some kind of you know really uh, really um, obscure reference of some sort. That I'm just not not seeing. I I have no idea. But yeah, let's uh, let's dive into here. And um, actually, this I guess this starts at 1850. So okay, let's let's uh, display these guys, and we'll take a look. Like I said, at the first few, see what they're going after right now. So yeah, you know, molecular gas. Of course, this is in M42, M43. So, you know, probably, hopefully, um, this paper, you know, just sort of mentions other uh, um, nebulae, um, including um, M20, I would think. Uh, all right, let's keep let's keep going here. So, giga. Um, 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 electron volt. I think these are cosmic rays, CRs. Um, star forming region, of course. Um, um, M20 is one of those regions. So a multi wavelength look at galactic massive star forming regions. And this was from last year in the Astrophysical Journal. Let's uh, let's take a look here and see uh, see what uh, you know. We'll sort of look at the whole thing, but then I like to specifically look for our target, you know, because otherwise we sort of get bogged down in these things and, and uh, you know, we'll never get out. Once we get into these, it's, it's like, oh, we're lost in the nebula. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so, uh, when, is, when is your next square day again? Um, you know, that's that's actually a good question. It's sort of looking like tomorrow night here might be clear, might be clear. So um, there's a, yeah, I, I mean, I think the humidity is still going to be pretty crazy because it's actually been raining here all day long. So, so uh, I don't know what the conditions are going to be in terms of the humidity. But uh, the forecast right now, um, and in fact, we can uh, we can go over there. I've I've got my own. Um, I have my own uh, designation now, Wayway Observatory. And as you can see, see so here's today, and um, this is local time, right? So local time right now is 1929. So it says that I am cloudy right now and I am most definitely cloudy right now. But as you can see overnight and into the morning, it's supposed to be clearing. And by 19 hours, which is, uh, you know, um, when it's dark enough, um, it says it's supposed to be clear. It also says it's supposed to be windy. Now, if it's windy, that's a, that is definitely a no go because uh, uh, you know, wind. In your queer sky chart, you got the humidity predictions. Yeah, yeah, and you know it's it's sort of saying right now, you know, fifty five to sixty. You know, um, 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 predictions even. Even these, which which are are actually pretty accurate, um, usually aren't aren't incredibly close. So um, so yeah, we'll sort of see, right? It sort of looks like maybe there's going to be some wind, 
maybe you know the seeing isn't going to be all that great. Um, well, you know, it says average, which isn't bad. Um, so yeah, there's there's a pretty distinct um, possibility that uh, it it will be clear here um, tomorrow, which means um, you know if conditions look look good, uh, then I'll be live streaming uh, from the scope again. I'll be doing my my obs session out there. So so uh, yeah, and um, I will definitely try you know to keep everybody um, informed. Um, whether that's going to happen or not. So, so uh, yeah, you know, just um, um, so queer stay conditions, tuned. but you got windy conditions, right? Yeah, it's sort of you know this is predicting wind, and you know if there's any kind of wind, you know that's going to jostle the telescope around, and that's absolutely no good at all. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to see you lose like a two hundred, three hundred dollar telescope. Oh well, no. I mean, it's not. It's not as if you know the wind's going to knock it over or anything. But what it does is it is it bumps it around, right? And so you know the star images uh, are are little streaks instead of you know nice round round things as they should be. So so yeah, you know that just makes you know conditions impossible. I just um, got wait. I just gotta watch out when it's like super windy and stuff. It will definitely will knock down my tail whip Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Now it's on a magnetic mount, but it's mounted on my air conditioner. But yeah, but still, it can happen. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, there's that. There's also a possibility, and let me look at the date here. Um, there's also a possibility that UT. Uh, January 15th, um, act, sorry, January 16th, um, that live stream may not happen. Um, uh, in fact, I think there's a pretty, um, it would be for the 16th. Okay. The 16th. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to take a little road trip with the boss and, and uh, it's going to be a long, long, long day. And I'm I'm very very likely not going to get home uh, in time, you know, to do the live stream. And of course, for me, you know, that is the evening of the fifteenth. So so, uh, um, but yeah, I will uh, keep you um, um, keep you all um, informed on on that too. I think I think right now that's about a a ninety a ninety percent chance that that. Um, that live stream won't happen. So, all right, well, let's see here. So multi-wavelength um, study, which is always, always great, right? I mean, if you can look at um, these kinds of objects um, in a bunch of different wavelengths, um, then you, you get a more complete view and a more complete idea um, about, you know, What's going on there? So that's kind of nice. We'll we'll have to uh, to find out exactly what the wavelengths are, but it sort of looks like, you know, okay, so um, three point six micron through ten millimeters. So so uh, you know, um, near infrared to um, to um, millimeter wavelengths. So not not quite getting into the radio. Yeah, you know, but going through submillimeter and um, millimeter, so so you know through the thermal infrared, sort of what it looks like. But you know, we'll look at some plots here here too. Um, so one, two, three. So yeah, you know, they're just sort of talking about the characteristics, you know, that they're seeing and all that kind of stuff. And of course, you know, they use models, which which you know, nothing wrong with that. At all. Right, welcome, you know, Chris Elliott from Elliott Astro Imaging. Welcome. Hey there, Chris. Nice to see you. So we're we're diving um, diving a little bit um, deep into some papers that supposedly talk about Messier twenty. So um, this is sort of a recent one. Um, let's see. You know, from September of last year published um, in the Astrophysical Journal. So, yeah, um, 
this is just a multi-wavelength um, look at some um, star forming regions and M20 is most definitely one of those. But let's sort of see, um, okay, here's targets and observations. Let's see if they have a target list. Sometimes, you know, the papers have tables and figures at the end of the paper, but it looks like we've got our, uh, we've got our list here and I'm seeing M17 and I'm seeing the Eagle Nebula, ah, the Trifid Nebula right here. So that's of course another name for the uh, um, um, M20. And, and uh, Chris, you know, you may know this, Simbad is, is, um, uh, is referring to, you know, the cluster of stars as actually M20 and not the nebula. And I always, I, you know, I mean, I was just told this, uh, you know, that the nebula is actually um, Messier 20. Um, but, you know, it, it, I, I guess, you know, it's sort of a combination of the two, right? Um, it, so it probably doesn't you know, particularly matter all that much, but- You um, say that it's actually is correct. Okay, all right, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that I was, you know, sort of misinformed on that, so. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, the nebula um, is definitely associated with the cluster. So, so yeah. Um, so, um, let's see, galactic um, coordinates here, which we looked at already, they even have a distance, right? So here it's saying 1, 1.57 um, kiloparsecs. I think... Um, Simbad, let's go back. Uh, let's go back. I think Simbad, you know, isn't totally up to date on a lot of things. Now, am I going to be able to? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to scroll all the way through these. <laughs> I'm going to scroll all the way through these. I'll just go to the bottom and then come up at it. Um, so Simbad right now, at least the Simbad database is showing 816 parsecs, which is of course point, point 0.816 um, kiloparsecs. These guys are saying 1.57, which is actually you know like twice as far away. So uh, let's see. This this is referencing a paper from 2005. This paper is 2018. Does you know? Does um, newer measurements equal better measurements? Mm, maybe, maybe, probably. So that's cool. You know, I mean, even if it is you know twice as far away, right? One point five seven kiloparsecs. Let's see, three point two six parsecs in a light year times one five seven zero parsecs. So that's 5,118 okay, um, uh, Chris Elliott, is M20 the Triffid? Um, yes. Well, and, and, you know, that's sort of the question. Is it, is it the cluster that is, you know, part of the nebula or, or, you know, the nebula itself, or is it sort of, sort of both? Um, and I guess my answer right now is that it's sort of both. Right, I mean, they're in the same location, um, you know, um, both, you know, um, both in the sky and in terms of, you know, physically um, where they are. So, yeah, you know, that's sort of one and the same, I guess. Um, and let's see the 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 earliest um, spectral type, which is, you know, sort of the the uh, um, the youngest, hottest stars um, look like they're o, o seven fives and oh I don't remember what the five is I thought it was because M8 is the lagoon it says on a hot skip and a jump mm -hmm. yeah yeah well at least in the sky they are um, at least according to this the um, um, lagoon is um, 
is what about um, 400 parsecs closer um, to us than the trifid is. And, and uh, you know, that again, um, like I was saying um, yesterday, um, oh, yeah, um, like I was saying um, yesterday, you know, the distance to the center of the galaxy is something like 30,000 light years, um, you know, 10,000 parsecs. Uh, so, so uh, you know, um, relatively speaking, you know, these guys are sort of nearby. Um, it just so happens, you know, that they're, they're in the line of sight with, you know, the center of the galaxy. So anyway, so cool. Well, um, this object is definitely in their sample. That's good. And there's a whole um, um, bunch of other ones here, which um, I definitely um, recognize. Um, um, like a few of these names, right? You know, the Flame, Nebula, the Orion, Lagoon, Eagle, M17, the Carina. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Um, the interesting thing, um, I guess, it, except except for a couple of these, you'll notice that the galactic latitude, um, which is the second number here, um, are all really close to zero, right? Which means they're very, very close to the galactic plane, which, you know, supports the idea that um, we're in a spiral galaxy, right? Because all-, all, so, all I have a question about this. If um, if M20 is supposed to be the trippet, why does Sandbad does not recognize it as a trippet but something else? Well, no, it most definitely is, right? I mean, it's identifying it as the cluster that's associated with the nebulosity, right? There, there are stars in this nebula, which is making the nebula glow, right? glow and reflect and it's it's those stars that are part of this um cluster so i would say that Chris, you know, the, yeah, yeah, your hypothesis is correct looking at sky safari it shows m20 as a nebula but not a star cluster okay yeah yeah see you know i mean you know here here we go because right? there's 30 stars make the nebula yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know, there's a little bit of a conflict there, and and uh, you know, probably you know, the Simbad folks sort of had to you know, decide, right? It's like you know, is it one thing or another? Because you know, what it comes down to, right, is that you know this is a database, and so all this information is being um, produced from um, information, you know, inside of the database, and so, you know, they probably had to choose, right? It's like, you know, is it a cluster? Is it a nebula? You know, let's call it a cluster. That's fine. I mean, we know what it is and there it is right there. <laughs> so, so yeah. And, and- Now, do you actually make a dispute to say bad telling that this is, this is supposed to be a nebula, not a cluster? Um, you probably could, yeah. Yeah, you probably could, and and uh, um, I don't know if that if that would you know bear any fruit or anything. But but um, uh, you know, like I said, you know, they may you know, you know depending on you know, the structure of the database and everything, you know, they might have to you know, be forced to choose, right? So it's like you know, what do we call it? And and um, you know, these names are or these um, designations, right, are kind of arbitrary, right? I mean, especially if you have a um, 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 cluster of stars and a nebula in exactly the same place. It's like, which one is which, right? Okay, now, so Chris Elliott, like the same day that makes him mad is star clusters and nebula have three to five different names. Yeah. And what is what? Like Orion could be N forty two, but it could be also be NGC. I think one nine seven six or seven or something. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, all all objects 
um, and I think I can say this pretty definitively, all objects and, and all stars, right, have a bunch of different names, right? Here, he, here are all you know, the names of um, this object, at least according to um, Simbad. And like I say, you know, I mean, these names are just based on, you know, different um, catalogs, right? Or surveys, right? You know, so somebody um, did a survey and they're looking for, you know, some kind of characteristics, right? Um, so they're looking for, you know, objects that have, you know, a certain characteristic of, of some sort. And all the objects they find, you know, that have, have those um, characteristics go into a catalog and it gets a name, right? I mean, it gets a designation of some sort. So um, that's kind of a neat, neat name, Colander 360. I like that one. I think I'm going to keep calling it that. Hey, let's look at um, Colander 360. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Yeah, that, that one that one sticks in your mind, doesn't it? It that that one definitely sticks in my mind. <laughs> so now you know where my mind is. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. All right. So this guy is definitely part of their little um, survey here. Um, oh, look, it, it actually says that um, in um, four cases, including the um, Triffid, the um, distance measurements are based on a single star. Now, the cool thing is, is that, well, and in fact, they mention it here, um, we could actually go into Gaia um, and look at the parallax of those, those stars um, and see, you know, um, what the distances there are. There are uh, so so uh, yeah you know lots of ways of doing this. All right, let's uh, yeah, let's. Yeah, yeah, his favorite is the Cadwell objects or the Vandenberg objects. Cool, cool. All right, so let's see. They looked at these objects with Spitzer, with something called MSX. I don't know what MSX is. Um, it looks like it's a um, far infrared, you know, sort of a thermal infrared. Um, um, device. Um, oh, okay, it's a satellite. Cool. I've never heard of the um, MSX um, satellite. Lots of things I don't hear about. Um, Iris, which, uh, yeah, I don't think is um, functional anymore. Herschel. Planck. Cool. Um, so then, you know, they talk about how they made, you know, the measurements themselves. There's a little example of Orion there. Yay. Um, spectral energy distribution, cool black body. Now they're talking about, you know, their models and whatnot. Uh, like I say, you know, these kinds of papers, um, best thing, you know, if you don't really understand anything else, Go find some pictures, you know, go find some plots and, and, you know, see if you can, you know, make anything out, out there. Now, I really, really like, you know, their choice of colors here. That's, that, that's really cool. Do you see that? <laughs> that's kind of neat. Um, but let's, yeah, oh, okay. I, polar metric um, luminosities. Okay. Huh. Versus, I'm not quite sure what, as a function of n prime c from the Planck radio continuum. Oh yeah, that's that's going over my head. So yeah, let's let's keep let's keep going here. So, but yeah, these. Let's see, which one is the Trifid? It's the sort of the. Uh, so whatever this is showing, the Trifid is. I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell, I guess. It's one of these blue ones. Um, not exactly sure, but it looks like, it looks like a lot of the blue ones here, these guys sort of have the same bowler metric um, luminosity um, for what it's worth. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's a little bit interesting. I, 
I'd like to understand this a little bit more, of course. Um, so let's see, here's, here's a little bit of a spectrum looking at you know, some pretty long wavelength stuff here. Um, thousand micron wavelengths. Uh, let's keep going here. Let's see. Okay, so so here here they've taken their their data and and sort of applied it to their models, right? And and um, like I said, you know, most models have have all all kinds of you know knobs you know, that you can turn, you know, variables you know, that you can change, and that's what all of these are. I would think, and you know they turn the knobs and you know try to fit their models to the data, and you know the best fit, um, you know they look at you know the values of the variables and say that's what it is, right? So, and that's what all these numbers are, right? And I'm 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 not going to try you know to go through a lot of these, um, but. I can recognize a few of these, like um, temperature in, um, let's see, that's a black body temperature, I guess. So that's that's very, very cold, right? I mean, if that's Kelvin, we're talking about, you know, 34.9 degrees Kelvin, I guess. Um, so pretty cold gas out there. So yeah, kind of interesting. And Elliot, Chris, Elliot, it's got to be some type of intense information there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. All right, let's let's keep going here. Stellar parameters. Okay. It's just it's just amazing how much how much work and how much effort and thinking you know goes into all of these papers it's just it's just absolutely fabulous I, I think it's great um so here we go here's the triffid look let's see if we can um lyman um continuum rates so um lyman has to do um the hydrogen lines um but yeah i'm not quite sure what a continuum rate is uh, it's too bad. I'm, I mean, we can sort of compare though, right? And if we look at the Trifid, which is our object of the day, of course, and sort of compare it to Orion and to the Lagoon. Yeah, you know, it's sort of looking like, you know, the Trifid and Orion, you know, whatever these numbers are, which, which I'm not even going to try to um, try to understand in this short amount of time. Um, looks like you know the characteristics of at least some of the characteristics of you know, the Trifid and um, the Orion um, Nebula are sort of similar. Where you know the Lagoon, pretty different, right? Um, except here, yeah, you know. So yeah, it's um. So yeah, that's kind of interesting, you know. Um, here's a 0.58, and here's here's one, M17. That's a 22.39. So so yeah, you know, there's something significantly different there, you know, between those two. And yeah, you know, without um, getting into it a lot a lot more, I. I would have absolutely no idea, but yeah, there's quite a variation, right? You know, I mean, if 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 all of these are sort of you know star forming regions, there's a huge variation here, right? Going from 0 0.09 all the way up to 100 and um, um, 37. So so uh, yeah, don't don't really know what's going on there. Lots of variation, which uh, probably makes things harder to understand, even for them. And you know, a lot of times, you know, the only people that can really, really understand this kind of stuff 
are actually the authors themselves, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, a standard, you know, so-called you know, professional astronomer looking at this um, is extremely likely to be almost as confused as I am about all of this. So, <laughs> um, so let's see, photon rate from radio observations. It's a nice long paper, of course. Uh, da, 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 da. More math, more plots. Fraction of the monochromatic luminosities of total luminosity as a function of total luminosity derived from the global SED, which uh, spectral energy distribution. It's just a fancy way of saying a spectrum. Um, so, all right. I do like their um, color coding. I think that's kind of a clever way. It's kind of hard to tell which one is which, but it's it's kind of neat what they've done there. Um, that's kind of artsy fartsy, which I like. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Okay, so here's another table. So monochromatic luminosities and SFRs. Ooh, I don't know what an SFR is. Can we, uh, maybe we can try to find out exactly what an SFR is. There's also an MSFR. Oh, it just gets, oh, okay. Over your head. SFR is a star forming region. And, uh, a, we just want to come. and, a, and an MSFR is a massive star star forming region so yay okay so monochromatic luminosities um which is just you know that's just a measurement of intrinsic brightness so yeah this this is something that i i can almost understand i guess um so they're talking about 10 to the minus third solar masses per per year i i guess that's a solar mass mm. why wouldn't that be solar luminosity i don't know anyway here it is for the trifid and again you know without really really knowing what these numbers mean we can still sort of look at them and compare them right and sort of seeing the same same trend right this you know and maybe you know they ordered it um this way right you know they put these in some kind of an order where you know these are a little bit low and then it gets higher and higher and higher right so yeah again you know comparing these whatever you know these values are um 0 0.044 compared you know to 10.4 is it's a huge difference huge 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 difference so here it looks like they're looking at things at different wavelengths right eight eight microns 24 micron 70 micron so yeah this is um you know sort of far infrared very far infrared 70 micron is sort of getting into the sub millimeter range sort of so okay let's see top panel okay yeah i'm not going to get into this too much da, 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 da. all right well cool i'm um you know it's it's so easy you know to get lost in these kinds of things um that uh you know it's easy to spend way too much time diving into this this stuff but uh let's see if there's any more oh here here we uh it looks like we've got a maybe a summary here let's see if we can find see if we can find the trifid in here there's the eagle there it is so the trifid Nebula is an active um, um, 
star forming region near the galactic center. Well, it appears as though it's near, right? But it actually, actually really, really isn't. Um, but it harbors one of the youngest known um, star clusters. Cool. And um, is dominated by this star, HD 164492, which has got an 07 star, a B6, and an A2. So, yeah, you know, that's like super, super big and hot. That's also big and hot. And that's also quite big and hot. <laughs> so, yeah, it's got... It's got a multiple star system with three big hot stars. So uh, yeah, no wonder it's sort of um, dominated. Um, um, blue reflection, um, reflection um, nebula, right? Um, so the distance is still debated, going from 1.67 um, kiloparsecs up to 2.8. So, yeah, and even um, shorter, right? I think this is the number over in Simbad. Um, so using Gaia, they've decided on a number 1.57. And um, 3.7 um, um, times um, 10 to the fifth times brighter than our sun. So what, that's uh, 37, um, 37 followed by four zeros. So that's three, 370,000 times brighter than our sun. So that's pretty bright. Um, 10 to the 49th um, photons per second. That's a hefty amount. Um, uh, and that's from I guess Planck um, estimates exceed da, 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 are estimated. Yeah, you know, and again, you know, luminosity. This this um, luminosity value depends on the distance, right? Um, if it's actually you know further away, um, um, the luminosity is actually going to be even more, right? Um, if it's closer um, to us, it's going to be less. So, you know, a lot of things, a lot of these things you know, depend on, on how far away we think they are. Um, and, you know, in this case, um, you know, there's at least a factor of two um, difference, right? 816 versus um, 28, what, that's a factor of three, um, more than three. So that's gonna change you know, the luminosity um, you know, perhaps, you know, by a factor of nine, right? Because it goes, um, as the inverse squared. So, so, uh, yeah, you know, this could actually be nine times brighter than that. So who knows? Who knows exactly? Um, all right, well, cool, cool. That's, that's kind of nice. Let's, um, like I said, let's, let's go to the oldest reference. So I'm noticing what time it is. So let's, uh, I'm not, you know, trying to hurry or anything, but I, I do respect everyone's time. And um, so, yeah, here's the actual, you know, Messier list itself. But look at this photograph of M8 and the Triffid from 1894 from Mr. Barnard himself. Let's see if we can grab this one, I'll bet you Chris will like this. He's an astrophotographer. He's got a great, great channel. Um, Elliot Astro Imaging, is that what it's called, Chris? Um, so yeah, let's see if, uh, let's see if they have, so what, that's, um, that's a photograph of uh, 124 years ago. Ah, uh, it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to see it. Um, let's let's dig a little bit. I'm really curious to see if we can find anything about this at all. Uh, 
shoot. Now, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to see it. Um, dang. Oh, that's too bad. I would have liked to see that. Um, I wonder... I'm going to be a little bit stubborn here and see if... Let's do this. You know, good old Google, right? <laughs> um, let's do that. Put that in quotes and do, uh, or what's it? Was it Barnard? Was it actually Barnard? Okay, well, I'll go with that, Barnard. I would really like to see this if we can. Uh, Sinbad objects. I'm not exactly sure what that is. Let's well, let's take a look. That's all we can do. Let's take a look. M20. Yeah, no, it's just going to put us back where we were. Wah. Wah, wah. Huh. So, yeah, shoot, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to see that. So, all right, well, let's, uh, let's, let's go to the next one down. Celestial photographs with the magic lantern lens. So this is also Mr. Barnard. Um, let's see if that's available. There is a... a a link to a thing that said full paper there. So, oh, look at that. Look at that. I think we might have it here. Aha. Celestial photographs with a magic lantern lens. Now, what the heck is a magic lantern lens? Um, of a small lens in photographing large areas of the sky. Um, so, sort of like a, like a fisheye lens, I guess, were made. Uh, this will once show the value of an instrument classic work. I've made a great number of plates similar to these of the brighter cloud regions of the Milky Way and propose soon to construct a photographic chart from them. The present photograph shows six of the most remarkable parts of the Milky Way as seen from this latitude. Cool, let's look. Come on. We'll take a look at this and then and then we'll get out of here. So, okay, here, here we go. Oh boy, wow. Um, probably gonna have to, uh, go back up and look and see where he was looking here. Um, now let's, uh, let's go to the right ascension and declination here. So 1802 and negative 23, right? More or less 23. So, uh, 18 hours and negative 23. So that's not it. Figure five. Uh, it might be in this one, figure four. Probably not in that one. Um, what was it again? Negative 22. Yeah, it might be in that one too, figure two. Uh, come on. You know, it's figure like, one. Frank, when you look at the L paper, things we have changed from time to time. Isn't it cool? So I'm thinking that figure, figure two and figure four, right? Both are around 18 hours and negative 22-ish. That's 28, but that's all right. Um, it's probably a pretty wide field of view. So here, let's, let's see. You know, these things are actually marked. So, 
Oh, okay. Is this one, two, three, four? Oh, okay, cool. So, well, there we go. Figure two, figure four. Is it in there somewhere? <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, we've definitely come a long way, haven't we? So, wow. I don't know if he said anything about the field of view. Um, let's go down a little bit to sort of see if there's anything more here. Uh, okay, so the scale of the pictures is 10 degrees to one inch. That doesn't give us much to go on because I don't know how big these things are. Let's let's go back up really quick and see if he talks about the field of view at all. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like it. it. Doesn't look like it. Let's let's look specifically at Figure Four because he talks about it a little bit. Um, so this picture shows the remarkable star cloud in Sagittarius lying between the Trifid Nebula and the Swan or um, Omega Nebula. So the two small, sharply defined holes near the middle of this cloud are the most striking features about it, um, except the dark lanes and um, star streams in the southern part. Um, so, yeah, I mean... So that's why I showed you with a 10mm DSLR camera. Uh, yeah, those, those work much better than these, I can say that much. But yeah, apparently the Triffid is in there somewhere. <laughs> Um, figure four. Wow. Yeah, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Um, you know, and these, I would think that, you know, the actual, you know, photographs themselves, right, would probably look a little bit better than, than these. Maybe not too much better, though. Um, I mean, you know, we're definitely seeing things in here. But, yeah, I don't know exactly what the field of view is, right? You know, I mean, it says, you know, 10 degrees per, per inch, but is this one inch? Is this 12 inches? Is this, you know, a tenth of an inch across? I don't know. I don't know. So it's a trip is, and that would be like the size of a pea. Um, I'm going to grab grab my chat here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, um, uh, not sure, not sure. So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, probably if you were to examine this a little bit, bit more, you might be able to pick out things, but, uh, yeah, you know, heck if I can really see anything much in that at all, but, you know, this was like new, this was state-of-the-art stuff. Nobody was doing this kind of incredible work then. But that's, uh, what, 124 years ago. So pretty, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. So yeah, cool, 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 cool. All right. Probably well, like one of those cameras where like you got this little thing right there when you hit the button that, that flash will bang up and stuff. Yeah, well, you know, he describes it here a little bit. Um, you know, uh, um, this lens is a very small one belonging to um, to an ordinary magic lantern. So, yeah, we'd have to look up um, what a magic um, um, lantern is. Okay, here, look, it's it's um, 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 one and a half. Um, inches in in diameter and has I guess a focal length I guess you'd call this a focal length of um, four or five inches so yeah that's a very 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 fast lens right that's that's like f f f3 right so I mean that's pretty much almost like a fisheye lens 
which means, yeah, he's probably seeing a, a very, very large portion of the sky. Um, Chris Arians got some comments about, about uh, looking at that paper, and he's also remember something about looking at a picture in 1940. Yeah, cool, cool, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to sort of think about, um, you know, okay, uh, back in Barnard's day, right, 1890s, that was like state of the art. That was like, you know, the hot thing. That was the really, really cool thing. That was high tech, right? Just like now, right? We have high tech now. What's going to be high tech in 124 years from now, right? You know, are they going to be looking back at, 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 at our photographs and being like, man, how did they see anything in that? You know, I mean, is their reaction going to be exactly the same as ours is now? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I mean, you can extrapolate out and say, well, maybe, maybe, but what's that going to be like, right? Well, you know, back in 1894, there, there was absolutely, as far as I know, um, no, no way that they would have had any, any idea about the kind of technology that we have, you know, today, you know, digital things and all that. Yeah, I don't think in 1890s, I don't think, I don't think um, um, digital was really even a concept, right? I mean, I don't know, wait, wait for you, deep sky do. What's that? Check the chat. Oh, check the chat, check the chat. I'm gonna check the chat. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, hey there, deep sky dude. Hope everything's well. We're about to get out of here. Here though, um, we were just looking at some at some old photographs um, taken by E.E. Uh, e. Barnard of of um, you know some nebulosity and stuff using some kind of you know um, fisheye lens. You know about that big, and and uh, yeah, you know must have looked like a ball or something like that. You know, but we could probably look up you know the reference to a magic lantern. Um, and uh, find that out. So. Somebody, anybody says, go look at a silent film today, and it's like, wow. That's like no comparison. Yeah, yeah. Who knows how it's going to be, right? Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, you know, definitely film um, or glass plates, um, something like that. You know, photography. Um, we just um, don't think like, like Bonn or, or like in the 90s today. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we think, you know, that we're so high tech, but, you know, Barnard was extremely high tech, right? That was like state of the art, coolest stuff in the world, right? So, so, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, um, I think in the 1890s, you know, photography had been around for at least, you know, 30 or 40 years at least, right? So, so, you know, um, you know, um, um, plate photography and all of that, you know, that was a known, known thing. He's just doing, you know, some wide field stuff and actually, you know, pointing his cameras at the sky, which, you know, people still weren't really doing a lot of that. Um, but yeah, you know, um, you know, he says in the paper there, you know, that, that, um, a, um, 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 future paper, he's actually going to, you know, map positions of stars and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we're doing exactly the same thing now, except, you know, we use Gaia, right? So, so uh, same exact thing, just, just uh, you know, different, um, different um, um, technology. So very, very cool. I know I used some of the scopes that I saw better was glass. And mm -hmm. what was that with the Jupiter cam? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the the Jupiter cam. I'm not. I'm not quite sure what that is in reference to. Don't know. Don't know. Anyway, I'm gonna get out of here. Um, like I said, um, tomorrow 
at 10, at, at 9 a.m. Central Time. I'm going to be on uh, ERRT Radio. Um, Ron um, is going to be asking me things and, you know, having a chit-chat, um, probably about astronomy, I would think. Um, so um, um, check that out if you want. Um, it sort of looks like it's going to be clear here tomorrow night as well. So there's a, I would say right now there's sort of a 50, um, 50 percent chance that I'm going to be live streaming outside. It sort of depends on your conditions, right? Um, clear is only, you know, one um, um, parameter, right? It has to be clear. It has to be calm. It has to be dry. Um, I guess you know temperature. I can handle all the temperatures and stuff. That's um, no problem as long as it doesn't drop. You know to, you know, you know. Well, what? I'll cut it off at at uh, you know zero degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Right? It's like oh, there's no way. Oh, and uh, deep sky do it will be paramount that if you put links on the Discord, if you have us on the Discord. <laughs> yeah, night nightbot is just gonna is just gonna smash you down every single time. So so uh yeah. Um if if you're if you're on the Discord, which Bobby just um posted an invite there for you, um get on there and and um you can post it over there pretty much anywhere, um, you know, on the live stream chat if you want. Um um so yeah yeah um nightbot just isn't isn't gonna let you do that but what i can do the power the power that i have is i can post it here so that's that's gonna do uh, can you remove that functionality from nightbot well i think deep sky dude probably also also has to be a part of the blue crew so yeah actually the link that i have is too long so yeah you know just go ahead and and um post it over to uh um um over to the um discord okay so barnard's jupiter cam never heard of that never heard of that i'm intrigued Intrigued. I'm gonna have to uh, check that out for sure. But uh, yeah, you know, just join join the Discord. You can post things over there. There aren't, uh, you know, the rules are much um, looser over there. So so uh, um, definitely um, go ahead and do that. All right, everybody. It's uh, it is 3:23 UTC, and that means it is time time to get out of here. So. Have a great evening, a great day. Uh, make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Hit the little bell thing. I think the notification things are working pretty well. So I'm glad about that. Um, and Barnard was, was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know that much about him, but um, you know, his name, um, you know, when it comes to astronomy is everywhere, right? So yeah, absolutely. You know, he even has, you know, a real, a real star named after him, right? He's, he's got, he's got the star, right? So very, very cool. All right, you guys, uh, like I said, I'm going to get out of here. Um, make sure to hit you know, the thumbs up if you so desire, make some comments and spread the word about this live stream. It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying you know, to cast a wide net. But um, I am trying to find, you know, sort of my people, right? Um, and and uh, you know, um, this kind of live stream isn't isn't for you know all people, um, but it is for a few, um, and it's definitely for you because you're you're here. So thanks for being here, and um, I try to do this every single day. Sometimes I can't. Um, but that's relatively rare, and um, when I can't, I definitely try, you know, to let you know that. And it actually looks looks like right now that the live stream for the 16th of this month um, is 
very, very likely is going to be canceled. Um, I'm going to be doing a quick, quick um, road trip um, 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 with the boss, um, driving over to um, Albuquerque and back in in one day. So um, um, that's going to, you know, that's kind of a nice trip. And uh, I've done that um, several times. And uh, I definitely like that trip. Um, Albuquerque itself is, uh, I don't like, I don't really like that town all that much. But, um, you know, but, you know, it'd be nice to get out a little bit. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so mo very, very likely the live stream for the 16th um, UT time, right? So you have to do all the corrections. Um, uh, probably isn't going to happen. There's a really good chance that's not. So, okay. Um, live stream outside probably tomorrow. Pretty good chance. It's going to be clear at least. So, you know, if nothing else, I'm going to be taking calibration data um, right after sunset. So I'll be ready, you know, just in case. But, you know, the humidity has to be right. You know, the wind has to be calm. Um, and of course, it has to be clear. So we'll see if those three things all line up or not. All right. Take care, everybody. I'm going to get out of here. Peace, cheers, and all that. And I will see you later. Bye. Later.